So I'm Manu Kapoor, I'm a professor and chair of learning sciences and higher education at ETH Zurich. Productive failure is the idea that instead of waiting for failure to happen, we want to intentionally, deliberately design for it. So that when you try to understand something new, if I can design failure in that initial learning process, it can help you understand that very thing you're trying to understand in a very deep way, in a way that you can transfer. So that you learn it in a way that you can then apply it um, and the chances of failure later on are reduced. No, it's a way of designing these initial exploration problem-solving activities that invite students in a both formal and intuitive way to uh, use their prior knowledge. But we design these activities in a way that whatever they use would either not work or be suboptimal for solving the problem. And it is that signal, it is that thing that activates yet builds awareness that, oh, maybe I don't know this, or maybe I need to bridge this gap. And that's what we calibrate, and that's how we implement these uh, productive failure into you know, real classrooms. If you look at basic knowledge, so this is, can you solve problems, can you do well on an exam, and so on, we find that productive failure is as good as regular teaching, regular direct instruction. But where productive failure starts to really make an effect is the understanding of what you've learned. Do you understand what you've learned as opposed to just solving problems? Can you transfer it to a very novel context where you have to adapt what you've learned to solve this problem in a novel context? So transfer, which is really the holy grail of education, right? You want to learn something so that you can apply it in a novel, to solve novel problems that you've not seen before. And I think that's where productive failure outperforms uh, direct instruction. Yeah, so the evidence so far comes quite strongly in STEM domains. Uh, we don't have quite as much evidence in non-STEM domains, but more research needs to be, needs to take place there. That said, I think the human cognitive architecture does not change because you're learning math or language or history. It's the same architecture. So although we've generated evidence and mostly in STEM domains, I think the theory uh, should work uh, in the non-STEM domains as well. But the design would be different. That's what we're trying to do, because I think you want to bring the latest science of learning into the science of teaching, and whoever's involved in, the, in, in how we train teachers or how we uh, you know, support professors in higher, higher education institutions to you know, design their lessons well, um, that's what we want to do more and more, yes. You know, flip learning is basically has the same pedagogical model of direct instruction. You teach first and then you apply. Right? In flip learning, the idea was let's take the content, the teaching first, move it online so that you can reserve classroom time for more active learning. So when we, when we did a meta-analysis of flipped learning, we wanted to see how much active learning is really happening in flipped learning intervention. And much to our surprise, there wasn't much active learning happening at all. What was happening was more content delivery. Right? So in other words, all the meta-analysis that were showing advantages of flipped learning were actually not advantages of active learning. They were advantages of more exposure to content. You know, and that was a big thing because you know, you can look at effects and say, oh, this must be coming because of flip learning, because flip learning encourages active learning. But when you actually look at what people actually did in those implementations, that was not the case. Second thing we found was if during regular instruction you include active learning without flipping, the benefits of flipped vanish. In other words, just teach well using active learning, you know, uh, then you don't need to flip. Now, there are other reasons for flipping that may not have to do with learning per se, that have to do with access, diversity, equity, and all those things are very valid reasons. And we should, you know, I think the hybrid learning models are here to stay. But there is a way of flipping, uh, you know, classrooms that are supported by evidence that are more consistent, actually, with, our, with the productive failure model. And that's why with John Hattie and other colleagues, we proposed the 4F model uh, 
you know, fail, flip, uh, form and feed and form. Uh, you know, there's a model for flipping that actually benefits students uh, by engaging them in active learning. Because we don't start with the content delivery. We start with problem solving. We start with problem solving that engages students to explore. Uh, they may not be able to solve the problem correctly. That's the fail phase. Then the content comes so that they learn the knowledge required to solve the problem. Then the, you know, uh, the formative feedback comes and the assembly comes. So the original flip model is just first you flip and then you, t uh, then you have some uh, classroom teaching. So the starting points are very different and ask, the sequence is very different from that standpoint. Look, I'm already in my fifth or sixth career. I started out wanting to be a football player. You know, I played for six years um, and then my knees broke, so I had to find a new career. Then I became an engineer. But by the time I was doing my engineering and I told you about the final year thesis story as well, I realized engineer, engineering was not for me. Then I did a startup. This was back in the 1990s dot-com boom world, right? That startup also failed. Then I became a teacher. And then I wasn't teaching very well either. And in the end, I became an academic. So if you look back at my life, my personal experiences, these, these are stories and failures that are hopefully some now, hopefully now becoming productive in some way or the other. I, look, it's a great conference, very diverse, which is something I really like. Uh, the place, of course, is amazing, so I hope to look at that. But I think the interaction is very nice. I mean, we were in a session just now where I think we easily overshot because there were just so many questions and so many ideas and people from people around the world. And I think that's, that's the key to this conference.